just a few housekeeping items. Uh, you may want to adjust your volume because some of the presentations we have were recorded at different levels. And so you may find some are a little softer or a little louder than you like. So just adjust your uh, volumes accordingly. Also, just on a heads up, our internet service was intermittent today. And just an hour before the presentation, when we were doing some things, it went out. So that may happen and we may have to fall back on, on some other um, backups that we have from our committee, who's been just a wonderful committee. There's five of us who have worked on this. And uh, so just so you know, this is something totally beyond our control as some things are in life. Uh, our presentation, the refugee experience in the Advent Christmas narrative consists of three parts. And they will all be recorded. And uh, most, all of the recordings, or most of the recording is taken from the speaker view. So the participants will not be seen. But if you are concerned about that, you can just turn off your video camera. Okay. Our presentation consists of three parts. The first part is the housekeeping part, which I'm dealing with right now. And following this, we'll start our formal presentation. Uh, the second part is a video we've assembled. It's a patchwork. It's made up of internet videos and music and reflections from parishioners and members of our refugee outreach committee. And the third part is a discussion, which will be the last part of the presentation. So continuing is part one, the housekeeping. Uh, you may notice on uh, some people who may not be as experienced with Zoom as others, that there is a ribbon on your screen, somewhere on your screen that shows the participants. And when the video is being played, this ribbon might obstruct some of the video. So if you want to hide that uh, ribbon, if you look at the top of it, there are some symbols. And the one on the extreme left at the top is a minus sign. And you can click on that and it will hide or minimize all the pictures so you can see your whole screen. Uh, during the video, we encourage chat because uh, any comments, any questions that come to you while the uh, video is going on. Uh, Margie will be monitoring the chat during the presentation for your comments or your questions, and they will be included in our discussion following the video. Today is a very special day. Besides being International Human Rights Day, five years ago, the first government plane filled with Syrian refugees fleeing the, their civil war touched down in Canada. Today, 29 of the people who arrived from 11 families who were present five years ago celebrated this anniversary in a very special way. They got sworn in as Canadian citizens. <laughs> our wish today is that our presentation will be as disturbing and as heartwarming to you as our experiences with our refugee committee has been for us. Now I'm going to share, do a new share on the screen. And we're going to go to our video. We await and abide for four weeks during this Advent time. In our global neighborhood, many await and abide for months and years and generations. According to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, at the end of 2019, there were 20.4 million people awaiting and abiding for opportunities to journey to other countries for the chance of a permanent, secure, safe residence. As one humanitarian commented, mm -hmm. life is never easy growing up in a refugee camp. 
hopelessness and despair abound. In Canada, many await and abide decisions from applications and appeals to the Refugee Board. A strong faith provides comfort in the love of God to see many through this difficult time. Hello, dear friends and believers of the Gospel. My name is Elizabeth, and I am sharing my reflection with you, titled From Darkness to Light. Darkness means the absence of light. Darkness means lack of visibility. And what is light? Light is an illumination something that makes something visible something in this sense can be a place it can be a thing something can also mean our own hearts so we're talking about god bringing his light into the darkness of our world into the darkness of our lives into the darkness of our situations there are some good points to note and these are Light and darkness are never in the same place. You can never find them in the same place. In darkness, there is anonymity. You don't know it because you don't see anything. In light, there is visibility. In darkness, you can call for help. You can be heard when you call. But for who hears your call and wants to come help you, there is some sort of fear. The person is prevented from coming to help you because you are in the dark. In the light, even if you do not call for help, it is easy for people to see that you are in need and then come to you for help. Using the scripture from 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a people set apart to sing the praises of God who called you out of darkness into his own wonderful light. Some translations will say into his own marvelous light. So this call has been made. And for us to be here today means we have accepted the call of God. As Christians and believers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we encounter moments of darkness symbolized by challenges and difficulties. Our challenges and difficulties are numerous and different to different people. They are part of life, but when they do come, they weigh us down. That is our moment of darkness. That can also be classified as our moment of darkness. And as such moments, we find solace in the comfort of the love of God because he brought us from darkness to light. So God will always be willing to help us from any challenging situation into a place where we can be happy again and smile again. And he, our God, is able to do that for us as often as we acknowledge that we are in darkness and need to come to light. Christ is the light of the world. We, as believers of Christ, are also to become lights like Christ and help brighten the darkness around us, the darkness around the people we meet, the darkness around everyone that we can reach. In these days of cruel isolation and social distancing from one another, we are encouraged to keep bringing as many people as we can from darkness to light. Sometimes as little as a smile, as meaningless as a phone call, as little as a chat can go a long way. As Christ did to us, and continues to do for us, we are to try. We are to try as believers of the gospel to do the same for others. For each time that we are able to move from darkness to light, let us remember that someone may also be needing to move from darkness to light. In the dark, there is no help. In light, we find all the help that we need. May God continue to strengthen us. Amen.
Thank you for your attention. Of the 20.4 million people awaiting and abiding, less than 1% find themselves with an opportunity to flee out of darkness to a permanent, secure, safe residence in a third country. Within its 30-year history, our St. Joseph's Refugee Outreach Committee has journeyed with some of these 1% of people who have become our friends, neighbours and parishioners. Our mission statement says, we, the Refugee Outreach Committee, remembering St. Joseph's experience as a refugee, are called to welcome newcomers to our midst. Our Advent season presentation will continue, bookmark between the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew with the story of the flight into Egypt, Joseph's experience, and the end of the Gospel of Matthew, describing six simple acts of kindness which can welcome newcomers to our midst. Many of us do not know what it is like in this awaiting and abiding. The invitation came to the Refugee Outreach Committee to participate in these Advent reflections on the theme from darkness into light. This seems obvious with the experience of refugees, but what do I know about the experience of refugees? The more I reflected, the more I realized that I know less now than I thought I did 10 years ago. So I reflected on what I do not know. I don't really know what it is like to leave my home before, during, after it is threatened, damaged, or destroyed. I don't really know what it is like to embark on a journey that puts my own, my spouse's, my children's life in peril. I don't know what it is like to escape not knowing whether I will make it, be imprisoned, drowned, helped, or sent back. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Now, after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. I don't know what it is like to leave family, friends, colleagues, who I will maybe, probably, for sure, never see again. I don't know what it is like to not know about a country, a city, a town where I'm being sent. I don't know what it is like to arrive in this place and find out that it is colder colder than I ever thought possible. I don't know what it is like to have felt so out of place and then finally find a store that stocks familiar foods and spices. I remember it was at night. I was uh, 
in the city name in Mansour about 7 p.m. One day my son brought to the school. I just heard some gunshot and everything and people came and knocked the door, broke the door and took everybody outside. And after a while he came back because he said there is a man, he's dead on the glass. People in the street, they stopped me. They were killing people around of me. They tried to kidnap me from the car. They are shooting the people in front of my house. And we start to run, and once they turn back, they see us running away, they start to shout at us. They're going to ask my family for money, and they're going to kill me after that. I was young, but uh, I could see what was going on, and it was hard to see. It was so, so horrible. It was so dangerous to stay more. So I decided to move. Life in Bosnia before was, uh, was awesome. We were living like peacefully. I grew up a good life because my mom's family were good financially. I had small business, my restaurant over there. We have some problem, uh, we have some good, uh, you know, it's uh, normal. But uh, eventually, uh, like without, uh, you know, any warning or anything, it just started one day. We were uh, outside uh, when uh, bombing started, so uh, yeah, that was kind of unexpected. I left when I was 11 years old. Eight years old, I think I was 16. Our parents said that, okay, we need to do a bus ride. We were told we're going to the city for the amusement park. We didn't know that we are living for forever. Almost all the Iraqi people, they can't live in the camp. We were never in a refugee camp. We live in, in refugee camp, about two years in the refugee camp. I grew up in the refugee camp. You don't know where you're gonna end up. I think at one point we were gonna end up in Finland and then another point we were gonna end up in Sweden. It was a whole process actually uh, in screening before we get uh, approval. Finally it was, they told us you're gonna end up in Buffalo, New York. We thought it was New York City, but it wasn't. <laughs> Coming to the United States, it's also one of the challenging things. That's just a very strange transition, 180 degree. Everything was hard. For three days, we didn't even leave our home. English was completely out of my mind. My English was like, like zero. I couldn't talk to anybody. Like in school, I was just by myself sitting there. I remember being asked, what's your name? And my answer was yes. Everything was different. First of all, the weather. It was my first time seeing big buildings. This is the first time in my life I sleep on a mattress. We went into the bus and we were circling for like three hours because I didn't know there is a string you, you should pull, pull down if you want to get out. And then finally, my dad decided, you know what, I'm going to leave. I see a corner store that people are coming in and out, I'm going to walk there. And my mom, I remember looking out of the window making, to see if he makes it back safely. And then he came back all happy because the owner of the uh, corner store was Yemeni, so he speaks Arabic. And so that was like, that made my dad's day. We thought that there is only one kind of people, but when we arrived here and there is like white people, Asian people, African people, a lot of people, so, oh, okay. So maybe <laughs> we are good too, <laughs> you know? I start to looking for a job just after a couple of months. My first job is a mechanic. I work in medical billing. It's my first year college. Right now I work as interpreter and I love that job. When you start job, you feel proud for yourself. My salary start with that. 850. I was so happy. I help other people who were in my shoes. Every day I call my dad, are you proud now? <laughs> I'm just lucky to be here and go back to school as every kid's supposed to do. I feel that this community make me feel very welcome. I decided only one way to pay back to those people. I'm not rich, so I'm not gonna pay back as a financially. I decided to join the armed forces. Until today, I'm serving here about 13 years. What do you feel like you've left behind, or what do you miss the most about life there? Uh, I miss my whole life. <laughs> it's uh, not easy to leave the people that you love. I miss you. You had a sense of connection. You had a sense of belonging. I'm still searching for that. I like how everything goes here, but <laughs> it doesn't change me much because I still have the sense of where I came from. To be honest with you, I don't miss my country. Because here I found what I missed. I want to be more, I want to be better, you know. What is my dream? Uh, 
<laughs> there are a lot of dreams. <laughs> My dream was to go to school, uh, which I went for like uh, eight years. That feeling when I graduated, it's like something like no one can pay you for like when they call your name. One dream come true that I buy a home for the first time. <laughs> What's your dream for the future? I wish that I could be a singer. It's done. <laughs> it happens. When I saw my kids, they grow up in safety place and they study what they want and they don't need to do something they don't like it. That's the dream, what I need more. My name is Dimakile. I'm Nadine Youssef. Felix Madi. Hi, my name is Masera Fayek. I'm from Iraq. Bhutan. Burundi. Burma. I am a refugee and I am a global citizen. I'm a global citizen. I am a global citizen. I don't know what it is like to have no friends and then visit a school and find that a warm welcome awaits me and that students my own age who speak my language are there waiting to give me a tour. I don't know what it is like to return to that school for my first day and be given a job that contributes to the school community, to be recognized for what I can do and know once again the dignity, the pride of contributing back. When the astronauts came around the moon for the first time and they looked back at the earth, that's where we all live. And we were fortunate enough to be born in this part of the blue dot. Others were not. But that doesn't mean that they should not be entitled to the same benefits as anyone else that's on the blue dot. You can look on the TV and you look at films of people starving and in camps and there's no understanding hey. of them okay you really don't get it the only way to find out about it is to actually meet the people and the only way we can meet them is to bring them here the harfords particularly jumped at the opportunity i'm fortunate enough to have met them and become involved and so our group is it comes from a very wide area of southwest middlesex and it's bringing us together and everyone is involved and it's it's a great project and great fun. This current family are from Northern Eritrea. These Eritreans are just such nice and friendly nice and people. generous yeah. people. They really are super generous. And they have a sense of humor. Yeah. I have yeah. to say, we, we do a lot of laughing. You know, a small community like this, everyone gets to know, they get to know them in the supermarkets and in the stores and they welcome them, but they're so patient with them. And they've learned a lot. These people aren't any different than you and me. But you've got to learn this by meeting them. You can't do this from a picture on the internet. The children become yeah. Canadians within 24 hours almost. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and the, it takes the parents just a little bit longer. Everyone wants to be Canadian. <laughs> the whole family accept that they're safe now. They're not refugees anymore. They are newcomers. Yeah. Yeah. They're not re seeking refuge now. It says so much about them and, and, and about this program. I am from Syria. I own a shop about fix it small truck. Before war, I have a nice life. My country start war is 2011. So I go to the up north Syria, to Aleppo with my wife, with my kids. And Aleppo start war. I turn again, go to Lebanon. 
no future for my kids. It's zero percent. I took it on as a project as part of the church council at Sacred Heart Catholic Church here in Ingersoll. I was involved through our church, the Ingersoll Christian Forum Church. It's been a really amazing experience having a Catholic church and a Christian Reformed church, which often don't do things together. A lot of people from the town just stepped up. People that you wouldn't even know of would just <laughs> offer furniture or clothing. This pushed me to meeting lots of people and just seeing the very best in so many people. One of the benefits of a smaller community is the, the closeness you feel. They're not coming into a place where there already are a lot of Arabic people. And I think initially they thought it was a negative, but they quickly realized that within a month the kids were speaking English to us and the kids were in school and the school was so welcoming and community surrounded them. I have lots of brand new friends. They're really kind to me. Small town is good. Very good for language. I have friends I, that I know in this town. School is very good and nice. People nice. Teacher very nice. Help a lot. It's my home and I have a nice life. My kids be happy, be safe. It's now first time to, to start to build myself. We've really grown close to this family. They've really added a lot to our community. I can't imagine not having this family in my life. We haven't just gained a family, we've, we've gained friends. All the United Churches in this area decided to answer the call for refugees. The Al Hamway family, he now is working full time. He's working as an electrician and they're helping him to succeed to get his license. Yeah, we come from uh, Homs to Jordan and we stay in Jordan four years and after that we come here to Canada. The advantage of refugees coming to a smaller community are that it's easier to accommodate them in a settling, but also to travel with them to different doctor's appointments and for them to become acquainted with the community. A larger community is rather overwhelming as far as language and opportunities. The networking is a lot tighter. We were all advocates for, we have this family, we need to help them find employment, and word spread quickly in a smaller community. It's not too much people, you know, like if you go to a big city, you don't have, you can, it's very hard to find a job. Three months, I think, when I came, first came to Canada, I find a job. I'm working at Schroeder Electric in Kingsfield company. Abdul is now mentoring someone else who is a tradesman underneath him. Abdul's brother-in-law, Mahmoud, he's a baker by trade and owned his own store and operated it for half a dozen years back in Syria. He's very excited about the opportunities that might present him with employment in his field also. To see people coming from different nationalities and different places and different languages, it does open your heart and open your mind to, yes, there are other places, there are, it's a whole big world out there and, and let's welcome them here if it's safer here for them. It's impacted the schools, the teachers, the principals. They're just overjoyed that the children are just so eager to learn. You know that the children that they're interacting with have a different view now. They hear where these foreign countries are and they're asking questions about why the children don't have what they have. It's a monster benefit I see at the school. ويعني إنه صار في شغلات كتير تغيرات يعني بكندا كتير يعني ما توقعت إنه أوصل لهالشيء يعني أنا لو وصلت له هلا كتير يعني إنه مبسوطين كتير يعني. I am a refugee sponsor because I don't think that just because I was born in Canada I deserve peace. I think we all deserve it. I am a refugee sponsor because they're great people and when we're happy to have them here. I'm a refugee sponsor because I can do something. I am a refugee sponsor because 
They are fellow human beings because my family was an immigrant family and uh, started a new life. So why not help another person do the same thing? Because it just warms my heart to be able to offer the very little that we can that helps them so very much. Because I felt that I should be helping doing something. Because I have more than what I need. Because it's so much fun when we laugh. Because I believe in bringing other people to our country who might not have a safe place to be. I'm a refugee sponsor because the kids would say, we're free, we're free. Someone with whom we've worked has contributed a reflection on darkness to light. It is read by a committee member. Darkness to light, to me, is a transition from one bad phase in life to a brighter one. As a refugee, I feel that I moved from the dark life I was living, a life of fear, pain, suffering, and, and hate, to a great life filled with peace, love, hope, and joy. I experienced this when I came to Canada and was welcomed by members of Rock who introduced me to St. Joe's. This is now my family. The kind of love and support I have been shown is not something that I ever imagined. It has helped me forget about the cruelty I had to go through and made me believe that when you trust in God, all is possible. I had to flee for my life. And now, with the help and support from the Refugee Outre Outreach Committee, I can now declare that I found peace. To me, light means feeling safe and not to worry if someone will harm you. It means being able to smile. It means having a safe place to sleep. It means being able to share what I have with others. It means finding a family that loves you and wants the best for you. This is the light I have within me as we all prepare for Christmas. And I will continue to share this light that Christmas brings with everyone else because I feel this is the light we all deserve to feel. Thank you, and God bless you all. I don't know what it's like to be a child and separated from my parents, my grandparents for so long that when I see them again, I don't recognize them. Zainab Alomar can hardly believe she's been in Canada three years already. Now with a whole lot of hope and prayers and help from Canadians, she's back at the Windsor Airport with her kids, waiting for their Syrian grandparents. How do you feel about them coming today? We first met the family three years ago in Lebanon. They'd fled their home in Syria. The night we met, they were about to leave everything they knew to come to Canada as refugees. That night was the last supper 
with the elder Tambaris who would stay behind. Parting was painful. Wrenching Ida away from her son and daughter-in-law and her grandchildren, not knowing when she'd ever see them again. Three years later, the three eldest children are in school in Windsor, becoming fluent in French, learning English, and hanging on to their Arabic. Bonjour, Papa. Bonjour, Mama. Ça va bien? Je travaille beaucoup. Language, though, has been a struggle for their parents, still only at level one in English. What's the most difficult thing still for you to get used to living in Canada? Windsor has taken in nearly 2,400 Syrians since November 2015, adding to an already vibrant Arabic community. But even with government help, settlement is a long process and some have adapted more quickly than others, says Hugo Vega. In the work that we do, we, we know that it could take uh, a long time. It could take five to ten years sometimes for someone to really establish themselves. Um, you know, professionally in, in, in the different facets of their life. Uh, so I, find, I think that they're about midway in, in that process. I think we are seeing really successful individuals um, that are established, that are independent already, and others that aren't. The Timbaris were government-sponsored for the first year, and then when a Windsor group got involved, they decided to privately sponsor the senior Timbaris and an orphaned nephew. Lawyer Anneke Smith push to make it all happen. I, I really feel that it's important that the government, before they can say they did, did the job, so to speak, um, that they put something in place for family reunification. Because it's not just about the parents or the grandparents um, who might have come under existing family reunifications. In some cases, we've left, we've left the more vulnerable people behind. So even if we do nothing else, I think that's, that's really an, a moral obligation on us to take care of. So on arrival day, Anaki is waiting with Zainab. The trip from Lebanon has taken two days and the flight's been twice delayed. Then finally, after a three-year wait, Mohamed Tambari and Aida Abdel Karim emerge. <laughs> Greeting their daughter-in-law, meeting their grandchildren, who barely remember them. Bilal, Jiddo. Bilal, it's your grandfather, she says. Keenan, age nine, was raised by the grandparents and he'll join his cousins. The sponsorship group is responsible for the first year of settling in. And Zainab is grateful. So are the grandparents. Mohammed, at 72, is feeling unwell. But he's made it. For the time being, the Tambaris will settle their parents with them in their home. And after so long, it's a bit overwhelming just to be in the living room. Can you believe you're in Canada? Zainab is setting out a reunion feast. On this night, they celebrate a more peaceful future, so different from the last supper they shared together. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Windsor. I don't know really what it is like to have nowhere to turn and then find a friend to talk to at St. Joe's or at the supper table, the women's center, the mission. I don't know what it is like to be welcomed, given warm clothing, housing, contact with people to support me as I get accustomed to the weather, the language, the greetings, the money, the clothing.
I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. But Lord, when did we see you? When you did it to the list of these, you did it to me. Uh, last night we had 700, today we had over a thousand, and tonight we expect another 600. We work in shifts, we're a team of 10 people from our church. Preshovo, at the border of Serbia and Macedonia. Feeding, clothing, welcoming refugees from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Some ran from the Taliban, some from the cruelty of ISIS. Many lost family members, other houses or all of their belongings. Traveling for 9, 15, 20 days on sea in trucks, most of them by foot, with kids, tons of kids, some of them 10 weeks old, in cold, freezing weather, only with some plastic bags of clothes, thousands of them. We sent several teams from our church this winter. One night as I was serving refugees in the tent, I saw a little girl with a doll that I recognized. It was a dance doll, my little girl, that donated that doll for the refugees. So I asked the family to speak English and let me take a picture with the doll to show it then and be happy that we gave it to someone. And, uh, you know, after we took the picture, we started talking and they were asking, how come that your daughter gave this doll? And uh, I told them that we are from Arad, from Romania, and that we are from a church working. And uh, suddenly they stopped uh, and they start talking with the grandparents of the kids and so on in Iraq and suddenly the father who spoke English said you mean to say that you are Christians and I said yes I'm a pastor of a church that's why we are here and he said listen uh, how come that you Christians are helping us Muslims when our brothers back in Iraq are killing us and out of that discussion we start talking more and at the end of all I said do you mind if I pray for you? And they said, yeah, we want you. So we gather together and during the night we pray there. And once I was done with the prayer, I you know, ran to another the table to start serving. And the middle daughter, she knew English. She came to me and pulled my hand and said, Sir, when my father is crying, and I knew that God, God was there and he surprised them. And of course he surprised me. Let's not assume that the darkness into light journey is only that of our brothers and sisters who we call refugees. Are we not all aliens in a foreign land? Do we not all confront darkness, bondage, struggles, limitations, disappointments, broken relationships, fear, doubt, suspicion, anxiety, and lost dreams? Who leads us out of our darkness? Where do we find our light? <clears throat> Where do we find our light if not in Christ? And where do we find Christ if not in the least among us? The tables are turned. We thought we came to help, but as time goes on, we grow to understand that the least among us, those we welcome are our, our light. They are the ones who rescue us from the darkness of our own selfishness, our own broken dreams, lost relationships, fears, diminishing strengths. We and them, us together, Christ for one another.
Oh, it's him too? Welcome back. This concludes our video presentation. We would like now to take a period of silence for personal reflection. Might you take a moment to think of a word or a short phrase which sums up your reaction to our presentation? As a virtual way of sharing with so many participants, would those who wish use chat to send your word or phrase. At the end of this silent period of approximately 30 seconds, Margie will read the words or phrases and then begin an open discussion, beginning with the comments or questions that were sent during the video presentation. We'll begin our time of silence now. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to ask Margie to turn on her microphone. I'm unmuted, John. Okay, perfect. So we will uh, continue to have a little more silence to um, consider further. I can already see some wonderful words and ideas are being offered. But one of our guests who was able to give us a little time this evening um, has just a short few more minutes uh, before he moves along. And so I, I wanted to uh, invite uh, Kefialu uh, Janada uh, to just offer uh, a little bit of um, introduction to us about uh, his role in the Ottawa community now and a little of his background um, and more so uh, his experience of sitting with us over the last uh, hour roughly um, and uh, um, taking in what we've all taken in uh, watching this video. So Kefi Lu, if you're there, uh, I welcome you to, to be the speaker. 
Thank you, uh, Margie. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kassel Demeda. I am um, a uh, former uh, sponsored refuge. Uh, I was sponsored by uh, Walden University Service in Canada, WISC. I don't know, some of you may know. I'm sure Margie definitely know about it. And uh, so I came in 2006, I went to McGill, studied there, moved here to do my master's. And uh, now I finished my master's and I'm working in the government. I work, uh, it's interesting, I actually work in the Immigration Canada. So uh, coming from refuge and then now working in an immigration. It's uh, quite a journey and uh, quite an experience for me. And I'm also actively participating in the community. I'm a community uh, chairman, president of Ethiopian community here in Ottawa. At the same time, I also volunteer in uh, church, uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and then also with WISC, the organization that actually brought me here. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that program, and then I wouldn't be here, uh, honestly, if it wasn't for people like you who believe in people's potential and you know, in, a, in, in a trying to save people's life. Uh, I must say that, you know, the world is in a better place because of people like you. Uh, what you're doing is, it's, it's, uh, it's touching. And uh, I wish there are more of you out there, <laughs> but uh, it's, 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 it's encouraging. And then what you do is it's just impressive. You know, uh, it gives me, it gives me hope uh, in humanity when you see, you know, sponsors like yourself, you know, and you know, reflecting what you know, kind of recognizing you know the uh, you know the you know the uh, the uh, grateful things that we have here in Canada, and then also seeing you know people who don't have that, and then you know making a difference in their life. It means a lot. Uh, I, I, watching those videos, you know, watching those kids, I was once in a refugee camp. I can see what they you know what goes into their thinking. You know that you know you you cannot express it like what the feeling is and you are you know you are enabling them and then you are changing you know you're making a difference in how we live in this country so uh thank you for that and then i'm really honored to be here tonight and uh, margie thank you very much for actually inviting me uh to this to this session and uh yeah i much it's just very touching thank you guys i want to thank you cafe cafe lu for for being with us for this time. I know you have to move along for another commitment, but uh, I think you brought together so much of what we were viewing uh, and, and experiencing um, in the last short while, uh, watching and listening. Um, so just really nice to, to the way that your words brought all of that together. So um, perhaps what I'll do, knowing Cafe Lou needs to move along is just ask us again, John, to return to silence for a few more minutes. That will allow me to um, look through the scroll of chats, and uh, and then we'll we'll see what uh, the contributions are. If you haven't already had a few seconds to put something in, then you still can. Um, so we'll have just another thirty seconds or so to add to our chat. Thank you. begin to read there but for the grace of God go I darkness into light fullness of heart inspiring humbles and grateful awesome thank you well done refugee outreach committee Well done, St. Joe's Parish. <laughs> Everyone can make a difference, however small a contribution. Humbled and grateful. Love and compassion. Interconnection. I 
don't think I missed any. They're unique and inspiring. Um, I believe Cafe has left. Um, if he happens to be here and contributes, but I know he, a commitment came up as he was listening. Um, so at this point, um, we will look at whether there were any questions that arose. Um, and again, I'm seeing a new comment. We are a global family, touching and inspiring. Again, that interconnection theme that we saw. Hopeful. So a question has arisen there. How do we create more inclusive communities? How do we bring help people from darkness into light? I guess it's a, it's a strong question. So maybe we can uh, see if there's a, a comment or two. Anyone in the, that's present here wants to, to offer to that, that? I think that probably is our first question. Uh, yeah. So how do we create more inclusive communities? Um, don't know if there's anyone wants to speak to that question or send an idea in the chat if you don't care to speak. I think one thing we can do is just reach out and include people in our lives and simple things with neighbors whatever how you know sometimes people cross our paths and being open to including them in our activities um, i'm sure there's sy systemic ways of inclusion but um for me the easiest is is just to start in my own circle and and include people there that, that's where i'm comfortable to do it I think Deborah, that point came out uh, when they talked about the small towns in, I guess, southwestern Ontario, and and how they, that that seemed to be one of the benefits of the small town was was the um, the ease with which inclusion could happen. Um, but I think Ottawa itself is we discover as we live here, it's still a pretty small town in some ways, and uh, and there are lots of opportunities, uh, and our welcoming parish certainly uh, is a good place to be to be doing that but always trying to, to do more. Uh, I'm not necessarily seeing any hands. I know there's a hand you can put up. Margie, can I say something? Yes. I, I just wanted to say one of the things, talking about reaching out to somebody, I know that a, a sponsorship started from a woman meeting somebody in a bus stop who they didn't know, and they just started a conversation. And uh, the conversation turned into, as I understand it, turned into a friendship and where the, the uh, Canadian people here offered to help them with the sponsorship. And it began as simply as that, as, as one example of uh, reaching out, like simple acts of kindness. It's not complicated, yeah. Um, checking to see if there's a new question. Uh, would Parish Council authorize a special collection one Sunday a year at St. Joe's for the work of ROC? It's a very generous kind of question. <laughs> um, so there are so many strong, strong, wonderful ministries and uh, we do feel highly supported and we have um, tried our best to keep the parish aware of, of, the, of the very big needs because it does take a lot of of the financial basis, I guess a strong financial basis to, to respond to the needs. Um, but I'll, I'll put that out there if anyone has a, a sense of whether that's an encouragement for the parish council that could come forth. Um. Oh, I'd like to say that um, we have a parish council meeting coming up this coming Tuesday actually. And um, I think it's a good question to ask. Uh, we probably have a member of parish council, I think. Um, Donna might be actually on this call as well, so she might be able to say something about this too. But I'm sure this is something that could be presented as an idea to parish council. I, I am here. Um, thanks, Chris. 
And um, yeah, I think it's a great idea that we could bring this to Parish Council. I see Joan has already typed in. She would be happy to raise it at PPC. So yeah, I think we're here. <laughs> um, I'll just say that that would be certainly highly supportive of, of, of our work. Um, and we, we are always, uh, I see Louise Lalonde's face here and Louise uh, in our years with the, with the ROC, um, when I joined five, five or six years ago, she, I would keep reminded by her that um, whenever there's a need, we seem to find a response at St. Joe's. So I think that's what we're discovering is that um, we, we put it out there, we ask, um, people are very, very, responsive, generous as they can be and generous in many different ways. John Weir saying is time, treasure, talent, and it takes a lot of different capacities to, to respond. But anyway, thank you to the person that raised uh, the question and to the two parish council pe people and Christopher for um, taking it uh, into consideration. Uh, I don't know if you have any other questions or thoughts and don't feel it has to come through chat. Just if you're um, want to mute yourself and maybe just comment on something that you had in mind tonight or that you saw. Um, anything that I, I, I guess particularly thinking about from darkness into light, perhaps just anything that surprised you, maybe you would never have thought about before uh, or thought about in a new way. I'll just let you see if you'd like to Take that thought anywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Um, I was just uh, re recalling the video that uh, you had asked us to watch prior to this uh, um, gathering. And then um, also seeing the reunion of the family with the with the grandparents, and it was this these scenes of um, departure and arrival that are just so moving. Like the young man in the refugee camp seeing his friends leaving, and then you know it must have just been I don't know I can't imagine what the feeling would have been like, but it was it was so moving. Like like I was really moved, and then. Uh, at the other end to see the, the reunion with the grandparents. Like, I guess that's why that uh, there was a, some show on TV about that a couple of years ago. And that's why people responded because it's just a, such a um, life-changing experience in, in both ways, you know, met the negative part of it, not knowing um, what's going to happen to you when you're losing all these people who are leaving you and then being at the other end and welcoming people back into your life. Very, very powerful. Thank you, Joan. These are very good reflections for us all. Anyone else that cares to comment on something that stood out or struck them or they're wondering about uh, in relation to the theme tonight or in relation to ROC? I see uh, Louise's hand. I, I don't see all the hands because it's two screens. So is someone else, my small computer, someone else is trying to get in and I'm not noticing you, I apologize. So just speak up. We'll give uh, uh, Louise a chance to offer some thoughts for us. I find it heartbreaking that only 1% of refugees are being sponsored. There's, there's still 99% that are living in terrible conditions. I see another hand and just before I leave Louise thought, I think, um, yeah, that's, it's very significant. And, and, and sometimes those times of being in the refugee camp go well beyond a few years. Sometimes they, they become like a lifetime. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's an incredible small figure that uh, are offered the possibility for resettlement when it's unsafe to go back to where they came from. Um, 
I think the person that was raising their hand, uh, Mary, is it? Yes, Mary. Uh, you need to unmute. Mm -hmm. I see your unmute button. Thank you, Mary. There. <laughs> no, I, I just wondered if you could tell us anything about current refugees who are being sponsored. Uh, we had lots of stories from all over Ontario and they're very interesting, but I know you're doing wonderful work in the parish. Can you tell us anything about those families? We can, we can share um, some, some profiles of situations, I, I think comfortably. And uh, um, maybe since I'm doing a fair bit of the moderating here, I, I know Angela, uh, who co-chairs the ROC with me now is, is here tonight. And John, as you know, is here. Other members of the committee, um, Donna, Deborah, um, I'm probably missing some, but we're, yes. Yeah, so uh, Connie, is there anyone that wants to speak to sort of the current um, involvements that we have, or even possibly to future involvements that we're, we're looking at? Donna Bowers as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, Deborah, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to unmute myself on that screen. We can't hear you, Deborah. Sorry. Yeah, you need to start. Okay, sorry. I have no trouble. I'll start again. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I have an unquote here. You can hear me now? Yes, yes a little bit of can, fuzziness. Can you hear me now? We should be okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It was by design that we chose those videos and didn't speak quickly about people we help because we honored the confidentiality. Um, I think that other members, if they want to talk in general too, if I don't want to stop people from talking, but just to make that um, trying to be confidential sometimes is, is difficult. And this was one way that we could do that. But I could say that there's a lot of similarities in terms of um, the countries that people that we've worked with have come from the um, some of the travels have been the same uh, the refugee camps have been were mentioned in the films as well so uh, anyway that's uh, we could also say that we just finished a sponsorship the formal year part of the sponsorship but in spite of the formal part being finished we continue to visit with the family uh, we tutor the children. We've done a lot of Zooming. All of us have learned how to Zoom so we can tutor. And a lot of our work this past year was done through Zoom meetings as well. And there's some very courageous members on the committee, myself not included in that group, who in spite of COVID have really gone out to spend time with the families and things when, when it was necessary. Uh, future, we're definitely open to continuing and there might be a pot on a back burner, but I, I'm not the one to talk about it. So I'll, I'll end mine there. Um, does anyone else from the committee want to speak to any current initiatives that would be helpful to Mary understand a bit more how we, how we, how um, we do our work? Connie? I, I, I'll say a bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I had heard that uh, sometimes it, it, it was the, the young mother who um, was the last one in the family to learn to talk English. And I have really experienced that. I have gone into this particular home with Deb and uh, Robin, who has gone out to Newfoundland. She was one of our leaders with Louise Lalonde, uh, seven-ish, five-ish something years ago. And uh, so I went into this 
home, the mother was most gracious, making delicious cakes and serving them very sweet, which I love, and, and uh, much bigger pieces than we needed. And it was just wonderful being with the children and, uh, and helping them with their English and their math. And their English was improving so quickly. And then a year later, the moms hasn't. So um, uh, somebody asked me if I would like to help to tutor the mom on the Zoom and by phone. And I am just amazed at the improvement of that woman now. She is so desirous to get her Canadian citizenship. She just loves being in Canada. She loves just what you heard there, Mary, you were wondering about that freedom they were talking about. And was it the grandma or the mother crying? That really touched me, the sponsor, I guess. When she, cro she cried, Cornelia, don't cry. Um, she cried at saying, hearing the kids say, we're free, we're free. And uh, so this, this young mom is just so happy that they're all free and doing well. That, that she knows she's the last one to learn English. So she, she's just so highly motivated and it's wonderful being with her on it. Thank you, Connie. Um, in terms of current involvements, I mean, we, um, we, I think John may be speaking to that in just a second. I'm just kind of building on what Connie was saying and thinking of just in the last week, the sort of ongoing um, integration work that that we take on. Um, I guess if any of us think of trying to look at a, a letter from the, the government and make sense, what is it they're truly asking us in this in this particular piece of mail? Um, that sort of situation arises fairly often with people after they've been here several years is that, you know, making sense of an application for a daycare subsidy, um, trying to do a, some English homework that you were given online from your ESL school that um, is like a higher level of grammar in English and you don't have that, that background to bring to it. Um, just a, a lot of kind of making sense of Making, moving your life ahead as independently as you can, but knowing there are still people that are there as community to, to go to that um, they're staying with you a little longer maybe than a year or two or three because sometimes that's necessary. John, what were you going to say in terms of our ministry? Uh, and just a just comment that sometimes the ministry is not only with sponsored refugees, so we also have the opportunity to work with what the, the, the category of refugee claimants. Um, and I'll tell you a story that happened to me and Louise, you will remember these, this family very well. A number of years ago now, um, when I was, uh, before I retired and a woman came to me um, as a refugee claimant. So she had landed here in Canada, not as a sponsored refugee, she was eight months pregnant. She had a two-year-old and a 12-year-old. It was a dead of winter when she left her country. It was 40 degrees out. When she landed in Ottawa, it was minus 26 with nothing. Um, and because I was a clinician and she, she was going to be delivering her, her uh, baby soon, I ended up being acquainted with her. And I was able at that time to kind of call up Louise and say, what can we do? Can our parish do anything to help this family? Um, so it's not just sponsorships. Um, and she is uh, so grateful for the, for the um, support um, that the committee gave to her, that she's now well-established. Her boys are all well-established. She has her own business and Every time I speak with her, she just extols how she would not have been able to become established in Canada were it not for the support um, of, of the Refugee Outreach Committee, despite the fact that she wasn't a sponsored refugee, but a refugee claimant. There's all these different categories. And we have a number of people that I think that we're supporting right now who are not sponsored refugees, 
but a refugee claim is and find out about us um, by word of mouth they land up at the church it's again as as deborah said you know opportunities present themselves that um just are unanticipated sometimes yeah thank you donna and uh certainly a lot of our involvements have been especially in recent years with, with the refugee claimants uh john were you going to I, I, did, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, one thing in, in the videos, two things that just struck me so profoundly uh, was one was a little boy who they showed in school was saying bonjour, bonjour. Uh, that literally happened to a six-year-old after he don't, that I heard went to visit him. He'd only been in uh, Canada for, I think it was about three months. It was a number of months anyway. And we were talking and uh, he came up and he said something like, no three languages, no three languages. Bonjour, 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 bonjour. <laughs> it was just hilarious. And, and, and the other one was um, a, a mother who spoke to one of our, our uh, committee. And she said, I never expected to get so much help. She said, I just never expected it. It was not in, in anything I could ever have imagined how helpful people have been to me. And, and the same that was reflected in the video. And the talking about darkness to light, hope and despair, I echo what Louise said about what, what really bothers me the most about this whole situation is that there are, I think it's 20 some, 20.4 million people who are in refugee camps and only 1% of them will be settled in a year and 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 when you look at some of the history of the refugee camps particularly in palestine they they've been going on for generations there are generations of families who do not know the the uh, that life can be better than it is and just for basic needs we're not talking about anything more than just basic needs and and it's pretty um upsetting can be so there, so there is the, the hope and there's also the despair that, that we have to deal with in, in this situation and and when when we decided the committee decided how we were going to approach this we decided to take the the approach that of what we are dealing with and and we are fortunate to be dealing with that one percent who do come here and, and who do become Canadian citizens and become a great part of the, the Canadian fabric. It's just a wonderful experience to see the people coming. And, and in, in the, um, I don't know, serendipity, the coincidence of it, or the grace of it, whatever word you want to put to it, when the story, the national story about the reunification of the family, that is almost literally the situation we are in now. We are considering uh, a sponsorship uh, which would bring members of a family that we sponsored before here to Canada. But the, 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 there are simple acts of kindness which do make a significant difference. At the same time, the application process is extremely complicated. And you go through a period of uh, at least a number of months of doing the application, of writing a narrative that the family has to write about their story, and then getting all of this documentation, if it even exists, uh, to do it. Uh, but the other thing too, uh, Margie mentioned time, talent and treasure. Um, what, what surprised me too about being involved with this for a number of years is that we, we need three things. We need, we certainly need the money. It costs $30,000 to, 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 we have to have $30,000 for a family of six to, to support them for a year. And even that is at the poverty level. It's, it's certainly not any kind of rich living. But that's only part of it. Most people think we're, we're looking for money and that the organizations like ours are looking for money. We're not. We're looking for the talent and the time that is just as important. The skills that people have, the time people have uh, to help. Mm -hmm. And what, what I have found certainly is that people give what they can. The people who don't have the time or money will, time or talent will give the money. The people who have the time and talent will, will give that. And people give what they are able to give. And the St. Joseph's Parish, in my experience, is unique because literally, I can tell you one story of a man who literally came to our door 
from a horrible um, situation where he'd come to the country as a domestic worker and found himself, uh, the contract he signed was not being honored. And in the end, he was being trafficked. He was just being used for working 14 hour days, no break, it was awful. And he had no place to go. And he just literally appeared at the St. Joseph Church door for one of the liturgies and started to talk to, coincidentally, one of our committee members who mentioned to him about the Refugee Outreach Committee. He did make a connection with the Refugee Outreach Committee. And it's uh, been a five year journey now. And he got his refugee claim. He got his uh, support. He's now a permanent resident. He got training at the mission to be to cook. He's uh, his wife and daughter who he'd never seen was born while he was here. He was supposed to be here on a three year contract. And um, in order to um, protect himself, he had to stay here to become a refugee claimant. And so his wife and his uh, daughter joined him here in Canada. And the first time he saw his daughter was at the airport. And just extremely moving, moving stories of, of people. And it's a parish that has helped. He got food from the supper table. He had, his wife got help from the women's center. Like everything with, with St. Joseph's was accessible. He got spiritual nourishment through the liturgies. Like, like uh, everything was there for him. And he appeared by happenstance. You know, and there's a number of stories like that. And it's just that openness to do something and to be open to it, to overcome that fear that the closing reflection that, that Deborah wrote about how the tables are turned and the people who we work with, who we think in some sort of glorified way, we're going to be their light. And we find out it's the, the tables are turned. Yeah, so. Okay. I'm, I'm a little conscious of the time, but there is a very good question, and I see a couple of mics unmuted. Um, so I think, I don't know, Michelle, if you were thinking to add something, or Sharon, or or maybe I just noticed your mics. But No, no, I would like, if I could uh, sit, talk for a couple of minutes. Um, I used to be with the Refugee Outreach Committee uh, over a decade ago, but then I transferred to helping with furniture. So I've been working, volunteering with refugees for 11, almost 11 years now. and. Um, some of you know uh, the group helping with furniture we do more than furniture we do everything in the household um but i have seen all these stories so many times and been into their empty homes empty apartments and assess their needs on a regular basis uh, i had two families last week that we assessed we're still doing it during COVID. it's very different uh, i do it by phone now instead of in person but we're still doing that. We have, we're 200 volunteers and we have uh, almost 250 families on a waiting list. So the need is very, very great here in the city. Um, besides furniture um, and all the household equipment we do, um, we refurbish bicycles and laptops. So um, if the outreach committee needs any of that, you know that we at Helping With Furniture are more than happy to help you. Um, and you could pick up at our storage location on Canada Tech. Thank you. Well, thank you for speaking up and, and sharing with us the good work that you're involved in. It's, it's excellent. There's a lot of, of partner groups we discover that we make good connections with. Um, I want to just uh, be sure that we catch this question that came up, um, which is, have you considered building um, there's two questions actually. Uh, I saw this one first, it maybe we'll have time to go back depending on our, our time of night. Have you considered building a talent map of people in the parish, different talents you could draw from to help in various ways when families have particular needs? Um, it's a really good suggestion. I think it's one we can certainly bring to a, a, our next meeting. Uh, we meet once monthly. Um, we've tried to do that a little bit through um, our uh, formation of a settlement team. So in addition to the now 10 members uh, on our refugee outreach committee, two of whom are, are people 30 or under, <laughs> which is exciting for us to have some younger uh, people now contributing as well. Um, we, so we have that main committee that does a lot of the, the planning, the decision making and, and whatnot. And then we also have even here tonight, I see Dan Dorner and there may be others that are working as settlement supporters as, as backup to all kinds of, of work that needs to get done. But 
we could we could expand our knowledge and awareness of who's out there, what they'd like to do. Um, so I don't know if there's anyone else if I've really responded to that question, but I just want to say it's it's something we we will copy down this question and we will <laughs> and we will uh, remain conscious of it. And thank you, uh, Denis Paul, who who raised it. Um, I think it's it, it, it having the parish fully involved in as many ways as we can is important. And it's also it's important with our main committee in terms of just new ideas, new people. But it's important um, um, just for for the ministry. Uh, what specifically can can we as do as individuals is one of the questions. And Mary, you had asked about the current refugees being sponsored. Um, so, um, in a, I don't know if we want to. Um, add any more about that question, what specifically, if, if that still remains a lot of gray out there, maybe we, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to uh, some other members on the, on the screen. Is there anything you want to say in regards to that particular point, what people individually can be doing specifically? Well, I, I would say we're looking for um, people like people who want to have to people to approach us and say like you know i have a talent in something and i would uh, like to know we've had people for example on our settlement support team who say i i'm good at carpentry i have experience with that so i will help if, if someone needs help with it, simple things like hanging pictures hanging curtains things like that it is it, it can be it can become certainly become more co complicated if you go into people with medical experience or medical needs or lawyers we certainly would like to have someone with some legal experience to to help guide us and give us advice because we do um have situations where we are the people we are working with have uh, some legal issues they have to deal with and um yeah, whatever your talents are, just approach us and let us know you would like to help. We do we do have to follow a criteria, though, where all of our people, or at least are in direct contact with the people we work with because they are a vulnerable population. We also all have to have police records. We also have to follow the pastoral uh, code of conduct, which, which um, uh, governs us in order to keep our integrity and in order to safeguard the integrity of the people we're working with. There, there are things related to that too. Okay, I, I would also just like to say, and people are helping too, another thing, it mentioned too significantly in the video about the partnership between the, um, oh, uh, Sid Ibma, what does Sid Ibma, what's his denomination called? The, the Reformed Church. Yes. And the Catholic Church had had the partnership with the Christian Reformed Church. St. Joe's has a partnership with the Christian Reformed Church. That, like that, that was significant too, that we work with other parishes. The OMRA program with grocery cards, it has been very, very successful in the parish. Not only helps people in refugee situations throughout Ottawa, but it's also helping one of the, one of the families who we have worked with. Mm -hmm. They're helping with furniture we have used like we, we try our best like we cannot do it all part of our job is to delegate and to send things out and to network and to connect people so anybody who has connections with different organizations or that that they think might be helpful that too would be helpful we we need all kinds of resources thank you okay um i know we kind of rushed our our last few questions that arose but they're they're ones we'll certainly bear in mind and hopefully we can continue to, <laughs> to keep our conversation going and to keep building our connections and, and our involvement base. Um, so since it's 8.30, um, I think I'll turn back to you, John, um, and just know that we are here and certainly through the front desk at St. Joe's, any of our emails, contact information to continue what we've begun tonight. I know it's a little harder with the, with the having to be away from each other, but we can still make it all happen. Um, so John, if you'd like to uh, yeah, thank you. guide us now. Thank I'm, you. I'm going to share the screen in a minute and I'm going to, we have a prayer to end our, uh, part, end our presentation with. And I'm going to ask you again to mute your microphones, but at the same time, I'm going to ask you if you will recite the prayer 
as Donna says it. And uh, as soon as I get it on the shared screen, Donna will recite our prayer. And then we will end our presentation. God of our wandering ancestors, long have we known that your heart is with the refugee, that you were born into time in a family of refugees fleeing violence in their homeland, who then gathered up their hungry child and fled into an alien country. Their cry, your cry, resounds through the ages Will you let me in? Give us hearts that break open when our brothers and sisters turn to us with that same cry. Then surely all these things will follow. Ears will no longer turn deaf to their voices. Eyes will see a moment for grace instead of a threat. Tongues will not be silenced, but will instead advocate. And hands will reach out, working for peace in their homelands, working for justice in the lands where they seek safe haven. Lord, protect all refugees in their travels. May they find a friend in me, and so make me worthy of the refuge I have found in you. Amen. Amen.